Hello and welcome. This is the real beginning. I know you saw us a second ago when we were talking. Uh, well, you couldn't hear us. But greetings and welcome to Archeo Thoughts Talks. I'm your host, Bill Ochter. Uh, today, uh, we want to talk about uh, another unintended consequence of this ongoing pandemic. That is graduate students. Well, they're, they're not the unintended consequence. Uh, but in particular, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, those, those graduate students who are nearing the ends of their studies. Uh, things like they're defending their dissertations, productivity struggles, you know, how do you do a virtual defense in a virtual graduation? Um, and how do you go out in potentially the worst job market since the Great Depression? Uh, those and other topics uh, I'll be talking with this week with my special guest, uh, Christiana Krupa, a uh, NAGPRA research associate and doctoral candidate in anthropology at Indiana University Bloomington, who just so happens to be this month defending her dissertation. Uh, so it's going to be a very personal topic, I, I believe. So welcome, uh, Christiana. Hi, everyone. <laughs> So, yeah, so I was reaching out, um, as I do sort of weekly now, um, looking for uh, guests and, and topics. And uh, you'd reached out to me um, with the idea, with the, your own sort of like personal thing, because uh, right now, you know, the students have been left free. Uh, you're now confined to your home, um, but you still, you know, would like to finish up your PhD program uh, this month. So it's, it's true. true. So what are some of the so what are some of the tools and tactics that you've been using to try to actually make that that uh, accomplished? So I think importantly, um, since you mentioned you knew people that are in the early stage basically right, right now, I didn't, didn't have to finish my meeting after quarantine started. started. Um, so the whole sort of productivity issue of being forced to do the writing maybe in a way that you're not used to and in a place that you're not used to is something that I immediately noticed. <laughs> so um, I, I have mostly a desktop computer that I work on, which unfortunately is in my bedroom because I have a roommate and so I don't want to, you know, be working in the middle of the living room all the time. And um, those of you who may or may not already know this, your bedroom is not a productive place to write your dissertation, <laughs> uh, I would say. Yeah, no, no, there's a, there's a nice bed there to go sleep in, uh, if anything else. <laughs> that is calling yeah. me the entire time. No, no, I, I've, I've, uh, between uh, Twitter and people I know who are in, in, their, in their programs right now, um, I've heard other sort of horror stories. It's, it's along the lines of, you know, you've got folks, you know, realistically, you have folks who are already suffering things like um, anxiety and depression before this even started. Um, and this thing, you mm -hmm. know, not only because, well, PhD life in general can, can be a, a, a very stressful uh, time to uh, exaggerate things like anxiety and depression. Then you add the um, prospects of a uh, global pandemic. And for even a few of the people I know, uh, they're not even in their home country anymore. Uh, so they're isolated yeah. uh, from parents, stuff like that. So there's a lot of a lot of stress going on. So I, I would recommend and you've already heard this a million times, I'm sure out there, if you're in these programs, but I do it every week because, I mean, one of the things we need to do during this time is try to find ways to relieve our stress. Uh, and, you know, while writing's important, while getting things done's important, you need to take time for yourself, um, which, of course, mm -hmm. is the antithesis of what you've been beating into your brain for the last however many years you've been doing this PhD program or master's. I know plenty of people writing doing their master's dissertation are beating themselves up right now. Um, mm -hmm. Master's thesis. Um, so yes, be kind, be kind to yourself. This is not a normal time. You do not need to do normal work. Right. So they're, they're and around. I think it's, I think it's a little, um, I think it's a little hard to remember that when you're working on something like a dissertation or a thesis, because 
you know, there's obviously a lot of really great stuff going around on social media and other internet locations right now talking about how we should forgive ourselves for not being as productive and you can't expect other people's productivity to be like it normally is. Um, but you know, if, if you have scheduled a defense or something like that and you have a hard deadline for when you have to have your writing finished and ready to go for the rest of your committee to read, um, I think it just adds to the stress that you were talking about and the anxiety that's associated with that because I'm sure there are people who have you know, flexible committees and that's great, but I feel like you can only handle so much of the flexibility if you're finishing something like a thesis. Um, and I think that does make it really stressful for people, but I think you have, you have a really good point in saying, you know, if all we're focusing on is that and you don't provide any time for yourself or where you do other things, then that's just going to compound all of that and you'll burn out a lot faster than if you do allow yourself time to do those other things. So as a, as a qualify my previous statement, do not spend eight hours a day on Twitter. You need to go write. <laughs> spend like 15 minutes, <laughs> yeah. put the phone down and get back to writing. Um, just you got to give yourself the little breaks, the little uh, the little things. Because, well, hell, you're trapped in home for 24 hours a day. So you do have a few hours. You know, those hours you don't sleep, uh, spend one of them uh, relaxing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um Another problem I know that's come up uh, for uh, for people I've uh, keeping an eye on. See, this is I have the luxury I'm not currently in one. I finished mine a couple of years ago. Uh, well, master's program um, is not being able to access either your collections for collection analysis or be able to mm -hmm. go to your site this summer because a lot of sites. Uh, field schools are being canceled uh, for this summer, especially those that are overseas. Uh, they're being canceled. Yeah. So, so this then throws the monkey wrench in terms of timetables, where you're expecting I got to, my collection analysis will be done by this fall. I then begin the writing process this fall. I defend next spring. All of a sudden, that's all mm -hmm. out the window, um, and you're having to renegotiate yeah. with your committees and your, you know and your plans of not having to go to school anymore next spring are all out the window. Um, yeah. So that's, that's also a huge stressful time. And it's even worse because you're sort of powerless at this point. I mean, you can do some more of your writing, uh, but the hard stuff that you need to do, like the data, you need your data and you can't get your data. Uh, so yeah. that's, 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 that is definitely a painful feeling. Um, that a lot of folks are out there. And for anybody who's watching this who's not in the field of archaeology or in academic archaeology and going, what are we talking about? I mean, this also applies to the business world. Um, bit, plenty of businesses are still doing telework. They still have hard deadlines. There are still plenty of project managers trying to get uh, projects out the door in the window. And they still have hard dates. And they still have deliverables. And they still have budgets to make. Um, and they still need to be able to get access to resources to make those things happen, whether you're trying to do, uh, build a building or, con you know, make a software product, you still need to get all that. Um, picture a PhD being like that, except you do everything yourself. Uh, you don't have a contractor. You don't have an entire team uh, building the building for you. You're building the building. It's in your head. That building is, the, uh, is your thesis document at the end. Um, so that's how this would translate uh, outside of archaeology, in case you're wondering. And please, I enjoy uh, anybody who's not in archaeology uh, to be watching us and ask any questions. That's another reminder that the uh, uh, if you're watching right now, you know, please, please ask any questions uh, in our chat and we will try our best to answer you. Ah, great time. talk too much you get thirsty <laughs> it happens it happens yeah i think it's pretty interesting the the whole issue of accessing collections or being able to go to the field and things like that you're starting to see a lot of tenure clock extensions from different universities um, that are allowing faculty to be able to extend their their period of productivity if you will or their period of consideration because of this happening but a lot of people on social media and elsewhere are pointing out that they haven't seen the same kinds of extensions for graduate students. 
Yeah, um, no, which I think is really that. important yeah. because, yeah, we were on schedules too. And I, I don't know if it's one of those things that they want to wait to see when this finally ends and then do them on case yeah. by case basis. Um, but that doesn't help with the anxiety of those people who are currently in no, limbo. No, it doesn't. Uh, we're all, but I mean, we're all currently in limbo. We don't know when we're going to go back to normal. I do that because of, yeah. of a couple of weeks ago, we're not going back to normal. What you had in January, we're not going back there. Uh, it's going to be a different normal uh, from that point on. So that's the word of wisdom I try to throw out every week. Get used to it. The world is changing around yeah. us. And I think it's something that is going to apply to future archaeological work as well, because if this is happening once, you know, and none of us have a plan for a crisis response or how we're going to deal with the sort of outflow of the effects of this, um, I think it's those of us that are currently being affected is going to change our work and how we plan for things for a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, if nothing else, we, okay. are, we are a reactionary species. Uh, so we will have plans to cover the pandemics uh, in all future, you know, emergency situations. And then we'll get hit with whatever the next uh, problem is, which will have nothing to do with this. And we'll be caught off guard again because <laughs> that's what happens. If history is anything, it's consistent. Yeah. We're consistently caught flat footed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so with that, though, like you're still going to be able to defend uh, this month. Tell me a little bit if you yeah. if you even know how it's going to work. What is a virtual defense look like? Because I know, I know a defense is you're there, the committee's there. You've brought donuts and other sort of you know pastries and stuff uh, to sort of make them not nice to you and be not as mean to you. Um, and you stand in front of them and you and you're, you're, do your defense. Uh, but this time you're home, and they're all home. So how's that going to work? Mm -hmm. So um, for me personally, our, our university has switched entirely to uh, Zoom defenses um, using the Zoom platform that a lot of people are using right now, but is problematic for various reasons. Um, we're going to be using that, and the university has required that of all defenses through the end of the summer now. Okay. Um, and so anybody who's defending between now and the end of July will be required to use Zoom. And so that has made things a little bit weird. So in our department, normally the presentation portion of your defense, um, so where you talk about your project and what you did is public. So anybody can come either from, it's usually other people from the department, but you know, really whoever wanted to come could be there. Um, obviously we can't do anything in person right now. <laughs> so um, the way I know that the way some people are handling that is well, we're just not going to do a public portion. You don't have to present because you can't do it in person. And so the public can't be there and this other stuff. So it's more of a conversation between you and your committee. Um, but the way that my committee and I have decided to do my defense is that I'll still do the presentation portion and the Zoom link will be made available to people who want it. Um, so it's Fingers not just crossed. me talking to my committee. <laughs> Right, I know. Um, so I'm actually emailing it out to people to try to cut off some of that issue. I'm not going to post it anywhere. Yeah, no, I was, you know, I was at a uh, an archaeology uh, ha virtual happy hour last week, which got raided, and we had to go to a different platform. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, yeah, so Zoom is not the, the the most secure, safest, or and there's other problems. <laughs> Yeah, so oh. we're going to attempt to avoid that. Um, but so anybody who requests the link of me ahead of time, I should say, <laughs> and is interested in watching that portion, um, we're going to do that. And then that way it's not just me talking to my committee who is in theory already read my entire dissertation and knows what I'm going to say. You, you would hope. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit, I'm more comfortable with that because the point of my work is not for it to only be read by my committee. Right. Right. Good, good. You know, good. I'm so glad you, you have a public I'm, aspect. 
and we'll get we'll get that out yeah. of, we'll get to that in a few um, minutes so, when uh, we, we get to talk about your work a little more in a little more detail yeah so we'll do that um and so as far as i know every i mean everybody i know that's graduating in the near future is that's defending in the near future i should say um from our university will effectively be doing the same thing okay okay well that sounds that sounds good that sounds uh, you know like you're finding a way to sort of work around uh, all those problems on that. Um, I think when we talked pre-show, you, you, or at least maybe it was over a Twitter exchange, you had mentioned also graduations. Now, would that be group graduations or individual graduations? I mean, I'm just trying to picture that, like one big Zoom call with just a bunch of people standing in their kitchen with gowns on. <laughs> Actually, that, yeah, would be kind so, of a, that would be kind well, of a pretty cool sight. <laughs> It probably would be cool. I know there are some universities who are, who have announced that they're doing virtual graduation. Um, I don't, IU has not announced that they're doing that. I'm not really sure how they would. The graduating classes are often, you know, multiple thousands of people. Right. So um, they have just said so far that we will be allowed to walk at a future commencement event. So they're not doing anything virtual as a university. Our department, though, um, is doing sort of a, a Zoom virtual graduation event well, instead, that's, that's which nice. is nice. Because, yeah, yes. I mean, not everyone's yeah, going to be. Yeah, they don't normally do. Yeah. Not everyone's going right. to be in Indiana they don't normally do next it. time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. We're talking <laughs> yeah, over right. now. Yeah, we can't do it in person anyway. <laughs> Um, we can't do one in person anyway, and the department doesn't normally do a graduation event. But because we are effectively being deprived of our opportunity to attend commencement, um, they decided to do something for the people who are graduating, which is, I think, a really nice idea. It'll be much smaller anyway, so that'll be nice. Um, but, you know, you, you have this, when you are in graduate school, you have all these ideas of what graduating is like like being built up to you for however many years right. and now you don't get to defend right. and you don't get to go to graduation and it's just it's totally different than any of us would love to believe and i think that's you know affecting people too yeah um speaking of expectations and expectations potentially uh being crushed um Today's only Wednesday, so tomorrow we'll get the new job numbers. Uh, but as of the last two, right now, there's been 10 million jobs lost over the last two weeks. Who knows how many more jobs are, are being lost? Um, I don't know how hard it's hit the uh, academic community yet, and I don't think they understand, they know it yet either. Um, mm -hmm. it'll be how, how long this lasts, um, how much, you know, how much they're going to lose in funding from grant funds and things like that. You know, when when their rich donors all of a sudden lose m millions of dollars, they're not giving yeah. they're not giving grants to the universities. Um, so a lot of these things have to be uh, balanced in the future. So, um, so I guess we could start with with sort of you. Like, did do you do you did you do you have something sort of lined up ahead of time, or is this a sort of sort of yeah. source of anxiety right now because uh, you were hoping things were going to go one way and not another. I don't want to pry too much. You don't want to go into it too much. Yeah. I understand. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I would say for me personally, it's sort of a mix of both. So the position that I have in our NAGPRA office is a full-time position. And um, so I have a job that is stable, that's not going anywhere. Um, but I also did apply for a job at a different university that I interviewed for and haven't heard anything back because in theory they're frozen like everywhere else yeah i mean um, to be fair i've seen some well actually i've i've seen mostly tenure announcements not uh new hires that's been mostly what i've seen on the social mm -hmm. medias and i guess that's easier to do because that's internal <laughs> that's an internal yeah decision, so, so it's uh it's interesting the way that i mean there's a there's a Google Doc floating around out there that's been created by the professor is in um, that lists all of the universities that have announced hiring freezes, and so that's kind of interesting to see because it's so many places. <laughs> and that is. Um, but you know, people people have frozen in different ways. 
So there are some that have frozen all hiring. There are some that have just frozen staff and hourly, but faculty positions are still allowed to be searched for. Some have grandfathered in searches that already started. So just because it's frozen doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, but those of, those of us that are graduating this semester or next semester or, or even next spring have no idea what the job market really looks like because nobody's transparent about that. No, no. And uh, oh. I mean, it's pretty much also like, you know, these there's it's not clear how these 10 million people who've just lost their jobs over the last two weeks are going to go back. You know, are most of them going to go right back to the jobs they had? Do they need to go find new jobs? Um, it's it's completely unclear uh, how these things are going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you almost wish there was a better system that would have like, you know, just found some way to furlough these folks so they could just walk back into their own job after this was all said and done. Right. But I'll save that for my our, our political podcast. <laughs> we'll expand the channel. <laughs> we'll do it at all 24 hours. I'll just sit here and talk all day and all night. <laughs> talk about different things. Everything. Everything. Well, people who follow this channel know that because it's either me doing this show talking and um, mostly for the last four weeks about different as different ways the, the pandemic is affecting archaeologists. Um, and like we've talked mm -hmm. about museums, uh, commercial archaeologists, and sort of just a big overview uh, in previous weeks. Um, but if you come on a different time, you're going to see me playing uh, Elder Scrolls Online and uh, chatting about uh, the Khajiit. So uh, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the modern age of streaming. Yeah. Um, but even that has archaeological content, I promise. Keep watching it long enough. Uh, when I'm not swearing at uh, dragons, um, it does. <laughs> so, um, I think that covers most of the grad uh, issues, problems. Um, please, uh, anybody out there who has a question um, about, uh, you know, how this, or even a story about how this is affecting your... Uh, grad school school process uh, please please uh, put them in the chat um, if not we will move on so since you are defending we meaning yes. me and our audience would like a little preview like what what, what have you been doing all these years <laughs> that got sure. you to this um, that got you to this uh, point <laughs> so um, my graduate training is in ancient DNA. So we have an ancient DNA lab here that um, has worked mostly with archaeological samples from both human and non-human animals in different parts of the world. So um, my master's project and my attempted PhD project was um, to look at the genomes of tuberculosis that indigenous people had in the American Midwest before European contact and try to figure out how that tuberculosis was related to the types that we see today. Um, so it was a, a disease evolution project effectively. And um, so most of my background knowledge comes from that. Uh, that didn't work. <laughs> I was I was one of those PhD projects that it happens. It totally failed. Yeah. I tried it more than once and it just didn't work at all. Um, so very late in the game, I had to figure out something else. Um, and so because of my training in ancient DNA and sort of combining that with the NAGPRA work that I had been doing for several years up to that point, um, I sort of started to fall back on something that I've been thinking about for several years, which was um, the way that we handle um, Native American human remains, skeletal remains under NAGPRA, which for anyone that's watching that doesn't know what that is, is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, so typically when we talk about human remains that fall under NAGPRA, we're talking about skeletal remains because that's what we think of as human remains. That's what we're taught to think of as human remains. Um, and I had wondered for a while whether things like ancient DNA extracts that you remove from the skeletal remains should count as human remains. Hmm. No, that's a... 
So interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it is it is biological material that has been extracted from that person? Right. So in a sense, um, it's very different than what our minds normally think of as what the remains of a human being are. Um, but if if we consider the bone to be human remains, what about the other materials that come out of those bones? Should those be considered human remains as well? Yeah, that reminds um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. No, as I say, I say that reminds me of sort of the ethical debate over the, uh, the, 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 the extracted uh, DNA from Henrietta Lack uh, for so many years that was being used for cancer yes. research. Um, and, you know, they, this material was used. It was her biological material. Uh, but she was never recognized as the actual, that this was her, this was a part of her uh, in that aspect yeah. until recently, because they've, uh, they put a, a, in Baltimore, they've recently put a, a memorial to her, because I think she originally was from Baltimore, or when did, uh, she would, she died in Baltimore, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's very, very much like that example. <laughs> so um, because of my you know, personal investment in NIPRA as a law and as a field, repatriation work as a field. Um, I wanted to approach sort of that question of, should we consider these things to be human remains from um, the perspective of the indigenous people that I work with? And so I basically reached out to people that I knew work in this area and um, our tribal members and asked them, do well, they think that's true? And if it is, how does that impact the way that we do NAGPRA? So um, as, a, as a summary preview of my project, every single person I talked to was like, yeah, those things are absolutely human remains. We, we definitely consider them to be part of the ancestors still. And that's interesting because the way that I think museums and universities and laboratories treat those sorts of samples is very different than you would treat a bone. Right. We, we taught, we're taught to treat them as resources or as tools to answer particular research questions. Um, and we don't, we don't um, I think, train, I and mean, I certainly wasn't trained this way. This is just the, the way that Western science works is you think of things in the way that they're useful to you. Right. So, you know, it's, it's right. easy for us to think of a skeleton as, oh, no, this is a person. This is a deceased person who had a life and had people that cared about them. But it's harder to think that when you look at a plastic test tube. But in, in some ways, it's everything about that person's in that plastic test tube. I mean, not their experience yeah. that happened afterwards, but everything that made that person biologically is in that test tube. Mm hmm. Yeah, so um, that, I mean, I had, I brought that up at one point to someone that will remain nameless um, and expressed that I, I wondered if we could assume that these things would be considered human remains by the tribes that we work with and that maybe that means they should be repatriated. Um, and somebody told me once, well, we don't know that people think that. Um, so, so that was sort of my inspiration for like, well, then let's just ask them right. instead. We don't know because we didn't ask. That's that's been a long uh, tradition, uh, pre NAGPRA, uh, of like you know, they, yes. they, they, the Native Americans don't want these remains. We didn't ask them. Right. It's like they didn't ask right. them when they took them, in a lot of cases. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this effectively, oh, uh, I use that. Yeah, effectively use the information to be able to say, okay, yes, we know that people believe these to still be parts of their ancestors, which means they fall under NAGPRA and should be repatriated. And now that we know that, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah and you've been, you know, you've been in, in problem NAGPRA. NAGPRA is about a, a negotiation. Um, you know, it's, does it mean all these things have to come back? No, what, what it means is that you need to have a conversation. Uh, with the tribes, a serious one over, you know, how do they want these remains to go? It, in the end, it's, it's their call uh, of how it's treated and so mm -hmm. forth like that. And while we may want to do really interesting scientific studies um, of these ads, if, if 
if these tribes consider them to be culturally insulting uh, or you know desecrations uh, uh, by do by conducting these types of things, we have to respect that, and it will not be consistent because every nation is not consistent. It's another another myth we sort of need to throw out here right now. All indigenous people are not the same. Um, each tribe is unique. Yes. Each tribe is unique, and they and they set their own. You know, they look at the world differently, and that's why you have conversations and that. But I mean, you know this mm -hmm. clearly. I mean, that's and I'm glad to hear that you're. We're doing this sort of study, and we're working closely with Dagpra because those those things kind of need to be hand in hand. If you're working with with the human remains of Na Native uh, Americans, you, you should be deep in Dagpra, and so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would agree. Because <laughs> uh, because uh, I've met some other uh, sort of bio arcs who don't necessarily have that direct connection. Uh, with NAGPRA and their views are a little more scientifically leaning. It's the data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, it, it, you, you get the argument. But we could learn this. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's still attitudes about NAGPRA and about repatriation more generally are still a lot more old school than people like to think they are. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I think, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's why we need to continue to talk about it. No, I didn't, yeah, you keep bringing it up, keep uh, talking about it. Um, it's only in, I can even, like in the last 20 years, um, you know, the sort of, I'm here in the East Coast, uh, and, you know, discussing the sort of the, uh, the remains of enslaved um, peoples, because, um, a lot along uh, out here, there would often be on a plantation. You'd, you'd have the slave cemetery, which was sort of off to the side, uh, way back there. Uh, during the early and mid 20th century, when the suburban boom took place, uh, they would often people were often paid to sort of remove, you know, re repatriate or remove, you know, move the bodies to a different location. Some companies yeah. tried to just took the tombstones, replanted them someplace and just built the houses and the parks and everything else on top of the land with the bodies still in place. Um, I've not worked on a direct project like that, but I've known plenty of people who've worked on projects like that uh, here uh, in, mm -hmm. in city areas and things like that. Uh, because um, also in the 19th and 20th century, cities used to have a lot of small cemeteries. It's only in the early to mid 20th century that you start having this consolidation of cemeteries to like one or two or three yeah. big cemeteries in a city. Um, so not all those bodies get removed. Also, the value that a city or a state has to human remains in general, I think would shock most people. <laughs> um, yeah. They're very flippant. Yeah, I think right. <laughs> they're very flippant when it comes to human remains. Um, so it mm -hmm. becomes difficult to try to get through their head if you're dealing with uh, uh, Native American or enslaved people's remains that, no, you can't just do what you always do and just backhoe it and put it over there someplace. you got to treat it a little differently. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's always the worst when you get that story. I was on a farm once. Um, we were doing some uh, shovel test work out in a farm, Southern Maryland. Um, so it's a uh, potential resources for 17th century, early, very early colonial Maryland stuff. And the, the farmer, we've been out there for a couple weeks and the farmer drives up one day in his little beat up pickup truck. Um, he pulls up, he's got a little, uh, little grocery bag next to him on the, on the passenger seat over there. And he's like, you know that storm that knocked down a tree a couple days ago? That got me thinking. When I dug the water well for that area, I found this. And in that bag is a human skull. He's had it on his mantle. I for knew the, that was going to be what it was. He's had it on a mantle for the last 30 years. So we found we found an enslaved cemetery that way on the property. Yeah. So, so yeah, human remains is a, is a very, very... Uh, tricky, tricky place. Um, I try not to get involved with them as much as I can, but sometimes you can't help it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think things like farmland are sort of a special 
a special scenario because, you know, NAGPRA doesn't apply to private land. No. So technically people can do whatever they want. That doesn't mean they should, of course. Yeah. I mean, the guy only brought it to us because he, uh, you know, we were there and he was just curious about it. He didn't have to. Uh, it was his private land, right. which is why I was right. sitting on and the that's... mantle for the last 30 years. Yeah. And that's, I know, one of the things that people um, sort of lobby the legislation portion of NAGPRA about is that it doesn't affect any land that is not owned by the federal government. Right. And that's like, it will also. Like... And it should. It's similar to like National Historic Preservation Act, uh, which is, does a lot of the archaeology yeah. in the country. Uh, you, you go out into the field and someone's like, oh, you're going to take my property. You're going to steal this. You're going to steal. I can't do anything. <laughs> I, I can dig yeah. on federal property. If I find something, I put a report in, um, then the state decides to do something. And most likely it has to do whether or not they're going to build something here. But if it's your property, yep. unless you need a federal permit... <laughs> And that's, that's sort of a workaround to get that stuff done. If you need a federal permit, so if you're building a shed, no. You want to put in a cell tower? Yeah, we, we, we might come in for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, folks don't understand that we don't have as much power. We have, okay, we have no, here's, here's another secret of archaeology. We don't have any power. We are the least powerful people out there. We can't make anything happen. We can't stop anything from happening. We can't take anything. We just do as we're told. Yep. <laughs> so there. I, I, what does the contract say? Yeah. Uh, unlike what you might think about that guy right there, we don't do anything adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's for sure. <laughs> All right. So. So I guess you did lab work, so you didn't have any 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 field with uh, any field work with this one. No, I am I am a field work noob. <laughs> I don't I don't do that. I've never excavated. Oh no. Um, I have I have uh, I have bioarchaeologist colleagues, of course, that have excavated. Mm -hmm. um, but You're, I was a I was a lab person. You'll, you'll be the people we talk about when you come out for your, your first uh, project manager project. Because <laughs> you, cause you need anything <laughs> at this point. <laughs> but it's fine. Yeah. They'll be kind to you. Mostly. <laughs> Mostly. Well, no, that's fine. But no, the digger, the, the contract archaeology is a weird, weird field. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's small and insular and... You know, you're always an outsider until you become an insider. And when you're an insider, once you become an insider, you're there for life. <laughs> like like any yeah. small, like any small groups, uh, you know, you could. I think an ethnography of uh, of contract archaeologists would actually be an interesting thing. No, it probably would be. So for anybody, an anthropologist who are also watching this, that might be something to do. And then you can also pick up a. <laughs> pick up a shovel and dig and we won't make us fun of you as much as for just sitting around watching people. <laughs> just help a little. Help a little. <laughs> well, uh, Tatiana, uh, is there anything else? If not, we could begin the uh, whole wrap up. Nothing's to me. All right. I think, uh, let me just do one last check of the chat. You're all quiet, but you are watching and I thank you for that. Um, so we'll go ahead and begin to wrap up now. Uh, so I want to thank you all uh, for joining us. If later on any questions or comments come to your head, uh, you can contact uh, me at ArcheoThoughts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, my email address is ArcheoThoughts at gmail.com. If you like uh, what you've been seeing over the past four weeks, please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ArcheoThoughts. As little as one dollar can help bring more and higher quality content to you. Uh, links to some of the topics we discuss will be in the show notes. Please like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word. And once again, thank you. Be safe. Take care of yourself. And take care of each other. Goodbye. Oh, thank you, Stemholic. <laughs>